Greetings. I'm Howard Gardner, I'm speaking to you from a room at the Harvard Graduate School of Education where I've been teaching for many years. Um, I'm very glad to have the chance to speak with you. I regret that I can't do it in person because of scheduling reasons. I am a big fan of the Roots of Empathy undertaking. I learned about it a few years ago both from Mary Gordon and from Bill Drayton of Ashoka with whom I've been connected ever since we were fellow students at Harvard College over 50 years ago. And Bill is always several steps ahead of everybody else. And when he began to talk about empathy to me and then used the word applied empathy, I just kind of wrinkled my brow. Um, but uh, eventually he convinced me not only that I should be paying more attention to empathy, but that unless empathy was applied, it wouldn't do anybody any good. But this was all pretty much at the level of abstraction, and it took my meeting with Mary and learning about the actual program that's done with students in so many countries and in so many states within each country, um, having them get to know an infant and follow that infant through the course of the first year of life, that gave a kind of a concreteness which uh, I think all of us want and need. And I've since then, um, with my limited knowledge base, described this program to people and directed them to the website or to other kinds of information. And well, the wonderful thing is everybody gets it right away. That doesn't mean they get it in, their, in depth or in subtlety, but how can you not be able to empathize with what it's like to be a child and to be, have a chance to take care of a, of a newborn. So um, I accepted this chance to speak with you with uh, enthusiasm because I think the work that's being done by Roots of Empathy and the range of experts in different disciplines who are working with you and the challenge of coming up with appropriate means of documenting the effects of the, of the program, both short-term and longer-term. These are all endeavors that uh, I think are right on. So um, since I've already confessed that I don't study empathy directly and I, was, I first had to be convinced that this was something that's worth spending time on, why am I going to take up a half an hour or so of your time today? And the answer is that I've done work which I think is relevant, and this work raises questions about empathy, which I hope will give you pause. Um, but please be assured I'm approaching this as what we call a critical friend or a friendly critical, a fr sorry, or friendly critic, uh, somebody who I hope uh, enables you to think uh, more broadly and perhaps also more deeply about um, we might say the pros and cons of empathy. So I'm by training a developmental psychologist and a cognitive psychologist and if you know my work at all you know about the theory of multiple intelligences which I published literally 30 years ago and that was a contribution I thought to psychology but um, certainly has had much more of a reception in the area of education. And for many years I had the typical scholar's attitude my job is to produce knowledge, to write about it, to talk about it, but I don't have any real responsibility of how it's used. And I was brought up short uh, um, about 20 years ago, in fact, literally 20 years ago, when a colleague in Australia wrote to me um, and said, you know, Howard, your ideas are being used in Australia, but I don't think you're going to like the way they're being used. And this was in the days of email, but if there was such a thing as attachments, I certainly didn't know anything about attachments. And so I said, well, send me the stuff. And I remember very vividly standing in my office uh, across the street from where I am now and going through a pile of papers like this. And as I went through the pile, um, I said, you know, he's right, he's right. I don't like the way the ideas are being used. And then I got to the so-called smoking gun, a list of all of the racial and ethnic groups in Australia and which intelligences they had and which ones they lacked. And I said, oh my God, uh, not only is it not a shred of evidence for this, but it's actually very mischievous. So 
I went on, on television in, in Australia and I said, look, I'm not questioning the motives of these people, but this program really has no scientific basis at all. It's really um, scientistic, which is a negative term. And other people also criticized the program and happily it was removed from the drawers. Um, but this got me to think about, in general, what are the responsibilities of a professional? Um, I'm a teacher, a writer, a psychologist, uh, uh, and a public intellectual of sorts. What are my responsibilities? And then, and now we're talking 1994 and 95, almost uh, 20 years ago, with my friends and close colleagues, Bill Damon, a moral expert on moral psychology, and Mike Csikszentmihalyi, uh, who works in adolescence and is well known for his ideas about flow, we decided to embark on a project which we soon called the Good Work Project. And the question that we eventually formulated was how do people who want to do good work um, succeed at times when things are changing very quickly, technology is powerful, our whole sense of time and space is being altered even 20 years ago by the web and the net and of course now with uh, social media and virtual realities and uh, um, all sorts of uh, um, games and apps, uh, certainly the world changes very, very quickly. Um, how do people want to do good work then when markets are very, very powerful? And unlike the 20th century, um, you didn't have forces which could moderate or modulate the markets like the isms, communism, socialism, fascism, religious values, communitarian values. These are all things which can moderate or modulate uh, markets. Um, Roots of Empathy is, comes out of Canada, and I think Canada, the markets are not quite so dominant, but uh, uh, certainly the United States and Britain, England in particular, market way of thinking is very powerful. And here's where we begin to get into a little controversy. I think uh, a 100% market view makes it very hard to do good work, makes it very hard to have a good society, because if everything is um, only handled by cash value, they're the only people who get education, medical care, legal protection, indeed voting rights are people who have uh, a lot of uh, capital, then it's very difficult to see how it's possible to, to do good work. Well, uh, I'm sure by now you're saying, well, Howard, what is good work and, and how do you know? Um, and I can give you the answer fairly succinctly. The good, good work is work that is characterized by three properties, each of them begins with the letter E. It's excellent, it's engaging, and it's carried out ethically. So a good worker in whatever profession we're talking about is somebody who knows his or her stuff, they're excellent, cares, they're engaged, they look forward to Monday, they don't dread it, and carries it out in an ethical way, meaning not just is this good for me, but is it good for the people that I'm working with, is it good for the larger society. And for extra credit, good citizenship turns out to be the same thing. The good citizen is a person who knows his or her stuff, they're excellent, they're engaged, they care, they vote, they petition, they blog, they express themselves, and they do it in an ethical way. Um, that is, they're not just trying to serve themselves, but they think what's right for the polity, whether it's the community or the province or the nation or the globe, because we're global citizens now. If we pollute the environment, we're hurting the globe. If we have an infectious disease and we get on a plane and fly to another continent, we're also being bad global citizens. So good work is work that has those three E's, and we th talk about the triple helix of excellence, engagement, and ethics. And we call it ENA. This is a play on DNA, the double helix. That uh, has to do with biology. ENA has to do with character and what it means to be a good worker and a good citizen. And it's easier to do good work when everybody wants the same thing. So when we did the study initially, it was not difficult to do good work in genetics because everybody wanted to live longer and be healthier. There was no particular conflict or controversy. On the other hand, journalism, it's very, very hard to do good work because journalists enter the field for one reason. Editors have a second consideration. Publishers and stakeholders and shareholders have a third position. The public wants sensationalism and stuff br ever briefer and is not interested in stuff that's going on far away, even if it's very important. So it's very hard to do good work in journalism. And the, we actually have empirical evidence because of all the 
geneticists we worked with, we never met a single geneticist who wanted to leave the field. Of the journalists we worked with, and this is 10, 15 years ago, a third of them wanted to leave the field. So that's a nice unobtrusive measure of what it means for good work to be challenged. Um, out of this work, um, both with work and with citizenship, I came up with a distinction, which is my own, and I'm not going to blame Csikszentmihalyi or Damon or anybody else, but it's very, very relevant to my remarks with you today. And that's the distinction between neighborly morality and the ethics of roles. And if you haven't heard these phrases, you're not alone because I made them up and they're, they're not exactly viral. Neighborly morality are the things that the Ten Commandments talks about, the Golden Rule talks about. Basically, neighborly morality is how do you deal with the folks near you. If you remember the Ten Commandments, you're not supposed to steal from them, you're not supposed to lie to them, you're not supposed to kill them, you're not supposed to commit adultery, you're not supposed to disrespect them. That's, that goes back thousands of years. It has to do with how you deal with folks you know, relatives, people next door. The Good Work Project really has nothing to contribute to neighborly morality. It may even be built into the DNA, um, but I'm skeptical about that. Ethics of roles is a very new thing. It wasn't relevant when everybody did the same thing. Everybody was a farmer, everybody was a hunter, everybody was a gatherer. And it isn't relevant when people live in small tribes where they know everybody else, where it's just a few blocks, so to speak. The ethics of roles arises when you have a complex society where people carry out very different roles. Somebody's a teacher, somebody's an engineer, somebody's a lawyer, somebody's a journalist. And when people are citizens rather than members of a community. Well, what is the difference? A citizen is a person who's expected to know the issues in his or her polity, um, keep up to date, and vote about them, and also re register views in other kinds of ways that I mentioned before, petitioning, blogging, and so on. And when difficult issues come up in citizenship, issues like affirmative action for admission to a college university, or what kind of research you should be allowed to do with government funds, you can't look that up. Uh, you can't look up if you're a judge um, and uh, you know, whether and if you have a distant relationship to a client or you own a few stocks in a company, whether you should recuse yourself or not. If you're a journalist and you see something very terrible happen to somebody, but your job with a journalist is to describe and not to go to their help. Moreover, if you go to their help, your whole journalist team may get kicked out of that country. Uh, these are the dilemmas of the ethics of roles. Um, so now uh, you're wondering for the punchline, what does this have to do with empathy? Neighborly morality um, doesn't pose a lot of difficult problems for empathy because if somebody lives near you, and they're part of your street, your block, your tribe, um, pr pretty much you want to make sure that you can put yourself in those people's place and you can try to treat them kindly and well and um, make sure that you don't lie to them or steal to them or so on. But if you are in a role, like a teacher, say, and you've got 30 kids in the class and two of them require a lot of help, but 28 of them need to be educated too. You can't look up to see what it is to do. You know, the, the answers don't exist anywhere. Or if, like me, you're running a research team and somebody's having a real problem and you really want to help that problem, that, that person, but uh, you'll then hurt the rest of the research team and maybe not get the research done, and maybe not live up to the grant. Um, you're torn. You're torn, as it were, between what you want to do as a neighbor for those poor kids or for that um, uh, member of your team who's got some real problems, and what you do as a, in your role as a teacher who has to educate a group of people or as a manager of a research team who um, uh, you know, needs to make sure that the team can work together and they can get their work done. And so this is a tension between um, what you, the empathy you might feel for individuals and what you have to do as part of your job as a teacher, a journalist, an engineer, or whatever. Um, let me mention the journalist story because it's really quite vivid and it, it, it's based on a true event. There was a journalist who was in a country which was quite war um, uh, suffused. It was a war strife country. And there was somebody there who was helping the journalist 
and word was coming that um, some kind of a group was going to come to attack them. And because a journalist had uh, credentials from the developed world, he might be spared, but the interpreter wouldn't be spared because he was a member of the, of the opposition group. And so the journalist was in a tremendous tension because on the one hand, of course, he wanted to help the interpreter, he wanted to protect him, but he'd be moving, stepping out of his role as a journalist and instead becoming a friend, not covering the event. And worse, it might turn out that his entire newspaper would no longer be able to work in that country because he had taken sides rather than being uh, objective, so to speak. So I hope now that you're seeing um, what we might call the limits of empathy because roles, which can be civic roles, you know, you might feel that um, the person who lives near you would benefit from affirmative action. But if you think on the whole that affirmative action is not good for the country or not even good for the group that's being helped, as a citizen you may need to vote the other way. Um, and this, what this really means is that the norms and the demands of roles that we have as citizens and as workers don't necessarily have confluence. They don't necessarily come easily together with the empathy which you might feel for a neighbor, um, certainly for a family member, for someone who belongs to our tribe. You know, if you are uh, Jewish as I am, maybe you just want to take the role of other Jews, or if you're Baptist, you may just want to take the role of other Baptists. Or if you are a Muslim, you may always want to favor people who believe in Islam. But is that the right thing to do in your role as a teacher or a judge? Is that the right thing for you to do in your role as a voter? That's, that's very, very unclear. Even within the professions, and this comes out of our research, there's a big difference between being a doctor or a teacher or a social worker on the one hand and being a journalist or a judge on the other. If you are a doctor or teacher or therapist, by and large, you're dealing with individual clients whom you know. And it makes a lot of sense to try to put yourself in the skin of the student who's having trouble or the patient who is, whom, who is feeling pain, um, or the, if you're a social worker, you know, the individual, a family that's under a lot of stress. Um, but there are other professions like journalism or being a judge or indeed being an engineer where your personal feelings mostly can, will get in the way of doing your job and you need to be able, able to distance yourself from the people whom you're covering as a reporter or the individuals about whom you have to make a decision as a judge um, or um, if you are, you know, a... Uh, engineer, uh, you may have a relationship with somebody who you're building a house for, but if you know that it's not being done in a way that's safe for the neighborhood, you know, that, that neighborly morality has to go, uh, go by the board. Um, indeed, there's even evidence from a recent study, which hasn't been published yet, that when doctors feel the pain of their patients too much, it actually gets in the way of their making the best diagnosis and the better diagnosis is made when they're removed from the patient and just look at the symptoms and the various things that uh, should be done given that symptomatology. It actually raises very interesting questions about <laughs> whether we're better off having our uh, symptoms evaluated by live physicians or by computers with the notion that computers certainly don't have any empathy, but uh, human beings do. So um, let me try to make, make a, a concluding remark. Um, the, le the worst thing that could happen out of this talk is if somebody says, well, well, Dr. Gardner spoke to us from Cambridge and said we should, that empathy is unimportant and we should throw empathy away. Nothing could be further from what I'm trying to say. Moreover, <clears throat> when human beings are developed and the Roots of Empathy program goes back to infancy and focuses on the early grades of school, um, the developing empathy for your neighbors and people around you has got to be a very high priority. And it may even be true that you can't ultimately have an ethics of roles if you don't have that um, fundamental empathy. I'm not sure about that, by the way. That's actually 
an empirical question. I mean, you know, computers may be very good at the ethics of roles, and I wouldn't at all say that um, computers have any empathy, at least in the sense that, uh, that, that, I'm, that I'm talking about it. But as one grows older in a living, complex division of labor, many levels of jurisdiction tiered society, I'm arguing that empathy alone can get you into trouble and that it needs to be balanced with an understanding of what the requirements are, and these requirements can change, of particular professional roles and particular civic roles because most of us are citizens not just of our neighborhood, the kid next door, um, the woman or man down the block. We're citizens of a city, a state or a province, a country, uh, the globe, and I'll leave it for extra credit those of you who think we are citizens of extraterrestrial uh, societies, so the, uh, there are some people who think there are ones, and maybe we need to be ethical there as well. And so um, this is the reason why, with the three E's of good work, um, the excellence, engagement, and ethics, I'm not quite ready to add a fourth one for empathy, but I would say that en route to doing good work or good citizenship, empathy seems to be entirely a positive force, that when you are a professional or a citizen, you certainly shouldn't throw empathy out the window, but you should realize that human empathy, as we usually understand it, can get in the way of the kind of judgments that are needed when you have a profession of a certain degree of sophistication or you're trying to be a citizen of a community larger than the 50 or 100 people who, leave, um, who live near you. Um, you may remember um, the famous statement by the novelist E.M. Foster. He said, two cheers for democracy, because he was interested, as I am, about what your obligations are to people uh, nearby, as well as those to the broader democratic society. Uh, the thought I leave you with is two and a half cheers for empathy. Um, it certainly is vital for neighborly morality and a constituents of the ethics of roles, but sometimes you really have to stand apart, bury, even suppress your heartfelt feelings for a human being um, in order to make the right decision. And indeed, I had to do this just yesterday. Dear somebody at my university who I'm convinced um, needs to go. And um, if I were asked for my opinion, I would say that. But yet I was at a meeting yesterday, and this person was sitting alone, and I decided to go sit right next to the person and essentially engage with that person. And what I was doing here was enacting neighborly morality, but I think it would be disastrous if I let that lead to a decision that that person should be allowed to stay in the position that, that they currently occupy. So on that somber note, but I hope a note that shows that these are things I struggle with every day, um, I thank you again for inviting me to speak with you. I hope you have a wonderful conference and that someday I'll be able to look you straight in the eye uh, in person.